Pay close attention. The news you're about to see is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you the news that relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yisrael Hawkins. Well, in the news today, deadly suicide attacks at one of Turkey's airports, Israeli-Palestinian violence erupting, and transgenders now allowed in the military. Well, all these stories and more, but first, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is rejecting the idea that settlements prevent peace. Recently, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected an appeal by the Middle East Quartet to stop settlement construction. Netanyahu denied the claim that settlements were a barrier to moving forward with the two-state peace process. Well, the Quartet issued a report which accuses Israel of preventing Palestinians from growth and development by, one, confiscating their land, and two, demolishing their homes. The report also stated 570,000 Israelis are currently living in the settlements across the West Bank. However, these statements, uh, settlements, excuse me, are illegal under the international law. Well, the Middle East Quartet is made up of the European Union, Russia, the U.S., and the United Nations, and is trying to revive the peace talks that broke down in April of 2014. But Palestinians are not the only people experiencing severe difficulties in their homeland. The United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, or UNICEF, is sounding the alarm for children's rights in Iraq. They are now reporting how war in that country has had a catastrophic impact on Iraqi children. That's right. Just what are these children facing? Well, UNICEF says 3.6 million Iraqi children are at serious risk of death, injury, sexual violence, abduction, and recruitment by armed groups. And over the past 18 months, there was an increase of 1.3 million children falling into this category. That isn't where it ends, however. UNICEF says the number of Iraqi children in need of humanitarian assistance is at 4.7 million. Mm. The international organization describes Iraq as one of the world's most dangerous places for children to live. They appeal to all warring parties to protect children's rights in that country. And really, human rights altogether would be the goal. Well, in Texas, a family meeting with a frightening outcome. A mother called her husband and two daughters together in their family living room, not to work out any problems they had, but to shoot her own daughters right in front of their father. After being shot, 22-year-old Taylor and 17-year-old Madison ran out of the house, collapsing in the street. Wow. A neighbor got, a, got on the phone with a 911 dispatcher and watched in horror, describing how the mother continued to shoot one of her daughters in the back. Now, the shooting took place in the Texas town of Fulcher, which is in Fort Bend County. As Fulcher police arrived on the scene, they could not get Christy Sheets to put down her gun and in turn shot and killed the mother. Well, Madison Sheets was taken by Life Flight to a nearby hospital, but later died there. The distraught father, Jason Sheets, was escorted away by paramedics for counseling. He was not injured in the shooting, but believes his wife wanted to, him to live with the pain of losing both his daughters in this violent manner because he wanted a divorce from her. Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office is leading the investigation. Neighbors were in disbelief that something like this could take place in such a normal family in their own quiet town. This goes to show you that there is no place that is safe when people make poor choices. Well, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released data showing U.S. doctors received about $6.5 billion in payments from different drug and medical device companies in 2015 alone. It was reported that doctors owned about $1 billion in industry stock for the year as well. 
The payments cover things like meals, travel, and research grants for individual doctors, and also for teaching hospitals. This information was made public due to a provision in the Open Payment Act. Its goal is to, quote, to prevent inappropriate influence on research, education, and clinical decision making, end quote, and also to encourage transparency about financial ties. Interesting. Well, the American Medical Association calls this transparency vital and issued this statement saying, quote, the AMA strongly opposes inappropriate, unethical interactions between physicians and the industry. However, not all interactions are unethical or inappropriate, end quote. The data in this report includes payment information for more than 600,000 individual U.S. doctors as well as over 1,100 teaching hospitals across the country. The total payments are a bit higher than in the previous year. The Washington Post reported the doctors to profit most were neurologists and orthopedic surgeons. Interesting. Well, White House Press Secretary John Ernst uh, told reporters in a briefing there is no justifiable excuse for carrying out an airstrike on innocent civilians who have already once fled their homes to escape violence. The airstrike, which killed 28 and left dozens more injured, came during a ceasefire negotiated by the United States and Russia. While the White House calls these airstrikes unacceptable, U.S. military officials told the press that despite the controversy surrounding these signature strikes, they will continue as needed. Now, signature strikes are the U.S. military's assumption that if a group's action mirror those of a terrorist cell, then it can be concluded by their signature that they are terrorists. Mm. Well, this then gives them the right to use the drones to attack the individual or the group. So they're saying if they have the actions like the terrorists, they must be terrorists, therefore it gives us right to attack. Interesting, very interesting. Well, human rights groups protest drone attacks because the U.S. cannot always guarantee civilian safety. And in some cases, they cannot tell whether or not a civilian has been injured or killed. An anonymous senior staff member told, uh, reportedly said, we continue to reserve the rights to take action, not just against individual terrorist targets, but when we believe we have, for instance, a force protection issue or information to suggest a continued imminent threat. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter announced on June 30th that transgender people will no longer be banned from serving in the military. Secretary Carter said, effective immediately, transgender Americans may serve openly. They can no longer be discharged or otherwise separated from the military just for being transgender. In July of 2015, the Defense Secretary had announced a rethink of the policy in a statement to the press. This came just after Patricia King openly admitted to being transgender. Serving for 16 years in the U.S. military as a man, she was now the first openly transgender infantry man uh, in the U.S. Army. Elated by the announcement, King told NBC News that I've been fighting for this and waiting for this for so long that it was much more emotional than I anticipated. I had to take a moment to let those feelings sink in. Well, in other news, Russia is still involved in a tussle with the EU. Yeah, back and forth there. Larry McGee has been following that story for us as well as several others. Uh, Larry, what do we have for this broadcast? extended sanctions against Russia. The EU has decided to lengthen sanctions against Moscow for an additional six months, a move which Russia says is absurd and a continuation of Brussels' short-sighted policy. The Orthodox nation has stated that the EU's moves will not force it to change course. The sanctions have been leveled against Russia's oil industry as well as its finance and defense sectors. The European Union contends that the actions were necessary to force Russia to completely implement the Minsk agreement concerning the Ukraine. The measures were first imposed by the EU and the U.S. in 2014 following what Western nations call support for pro-Russian forces in Ukraine. 
alleged support for the insurgents who carried out the recent bombings at an international airport in Istanbul was the reason 24 people were recently arrested and detained by Turkish officials during raids carried out at 16 locations throughout that country. The bombers are being identified with the mercenaries of ISIS, and the alleged mastermind behind it all is reported to have been Ahmed Chetayev, a man whom Russian intelligence fingered as being the main recruiter of ISIS fighters into Russia and Europe. Known to some as Ahmed One Arm after having lost one of his arms during the Chechen war, he was on Russia's wanted list since 2003. Moscow reportedly attempted to alert America to the danger Ahmed posed, but he was nonetheless reportedly accepted into the West with open arms. It wasn't until 2015 that the U.S. and EU added Chetayev to its terrorist watch list. Up until then, Moscow's warnings were completely ignored. Sadly, ignoring the facts is more common these days than it is rare. Proponents of abortion were on the warpath this week, posing the question of whether or not the process of terminating the life of a fetus is risky for the mother. As the old saying goes, there are stats for every story, and never is that more evident than in the numbers being utilized by certain journalists in an effort to build a case for abortion. According to one study cited, there is actually 14 times more risk associated with giving birth to a child than in taking its life, with further stats suggesting the risk of death is only 0.0007% to the mother. The statistical speciousness abounds even further yet still for those who are interested, much to the delight of Malthusians in abortion clinics, since another stat is that half of women in the U.S. will at some point terminate a pregnancy. Apparently, the world's unborn aren't the only ones in need of defense. The EU is proposing to establish an army independent of NATO. Shared vision, common action, a stronger Europe is the name of a white paper released by the EU. And there is controversy now brewing with regard to whether or not its security vision interferes with the responsibility of member states to NATO. The EU is arguing that while NATO exists to defend its member states from external attack, Europeans must be better equipped, trained, and organized to contribute to such collective efforts, as well as to act autonomously if and when necessary. NATO's rebuttal has been a warning that the most important thing is to avoid reduplication. Secretary General Stoltenberg stated further that NATO has well-established structures that are tested and tried over decades, and they are an important part of NATO cooperation. Analysts also note the timing of the move following so close to Britain's Brexit since the English nation was one of the strongest and most vocal opponents of the proposal. Germany, on the other hand, has been pushing for it, and some suspect that the move might have a lot to do with Berlin seeing open feel now that Britain has exited the EU. Another big point of contention for the EU was member states meeting their financial obligations. Under the EU charter, nations are obligated to earmark 2% of their budgets to defense, but at present only six members are said to be fulfilling their responsibilities. This latest proposal by the EU, if embraced, would require significant funding, which analysts say would make it even more unlikely that member nations would have the funds to meet their duties. Israel feels as if it's its duty to protect its citizens has necessitated the recent sealing off of Hebron in the West Bank after an increase in violence there. Recently, a Palestinian woman was killed by Israeli officials after reportedly attempting to stab an Israeli police officer. At least one rabbi has been killed as violence between the two groups has escalated at the checkpoint connecting the West Bank to Jerusalem. This all comes as the quartet published its latest report demanding that Israel refrain from developing settlements and that Palestine put a stop to terrorism. For IPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Katan Jeff, back to you. Well, with such continued violence, it's, uh, it's very hard to see uh, peace anywhere in the near future. And we actually have a couple more stories coming up with more violence between the Israelis and Palestinians. That's right. 
Well, continuing on our report, meth has caused a lot of bad scenes within our society. But should someone who's visually under the influence of some type of mind-altering substance deserve to be shot and killed? Well, that's exactly what occurred when police in Burnsville, Minnesota, came upon a knife-wielding man high on meth sitting in his car in a McDonald's parking lot. The officer's body cam footage displayed how the event progressed from trying to initially calm him down. After they realized that he was having some type of fit, the officers then broke the passenger side window. That's right. After several commands to drop the knife, police attempted to tase the man with, of course, no results. Matt Com, the victim, departed rapidly from his car, still waving the knife while running away from officers, but was subsequently shot 15 times. Three of the five officers have been cleared in any wrongdoing in the death of Matt Com. Well, halfway across the world, another knife-wielding man died at Jerusalem's Damascus Gate. Now, at the spot where he drew his last breath, people gathered to say prayers. The violent death was shown from footage taken from ITV News. It shows the man sprinting down, down the stairway away from officers towards the gate when he was shot repeatedly even after he hits the ground. Shalom Palid said that the shooting was justified because he tried to attack the officers with a knife and that the officers responded exactly how they were taught. Take a look at what he had to say. There is no doubt because he tried to attack with a knife the police officers. Can you describe the officers' reaction to that? The officers yeah, reacted as how, how they, we, we teach them, how we train them. How are they? We, we teach them. How we train them. How are they? We, we teach them. How we train them. Well, I guess if you continue to teach violence, you're only going to get violence out. That's absolutely correct. And so far, the last two weeks, uh, there has been stabbing incidents in Israel, leading to five Israeli deaths and the attackers shot on sight. Israeli uh, police said that of the last shooting, the man uh, posed a lethal threat, they said, so he was dealt with with lethal force. Palestinian eyewitnesses are enraged and angered at what they say as a completely unjustified use of police force. A local shopkeeper, Mahmoud Castro, said they didn't shoot him to stop him, they shot to kill. They're using M16 rifles, and they shot him with maybe about 100 bullets, more than enough to disable a suspect. Wow. He also said that this is racism and that this is a country of racism, a terrorist country. People on both sides agree that social media plays a big part in encouraging these type of activities. Palestinians say that the attackers are trying to defend their people's rights, an Israeli government minister, Yuval Steinich, said that this is what this was about hatred, and that this young man, like many others, was indoctrinated to hate the Jews, to kill the Jews, and to get rid of the Jews. You know, like the police, as well with the citizens, people do what they're taught to do. Right. Israeli police have set up more checkpoints to increase security and stop the attacks, but with the building anger in the city, so far those efforts haven't worked. Another Palestinian was shot dead after trying to attack an Israeli border police officer at the Lions Gate entrance to the Old City. Israeli police spokesman said that the officer noticed the man acting suspiciously and ordered them to approach the, sus the suspect so that he could be searched. Well, the suspect attacked an officer with a knife but he was wearing a protective vest, so the officer wasn't injured. So far, four Israelis and 24 Palestinians, including children, have been killed in over 12 days of the violence. So you can see it's really starting to heat up again in that area. That's right. This aggression is fueled by Palestinian anger over increased visits by the Israelis to the Alaska Mosque. An Israeli official reportedly urged residents to carry weapons for increased protection amidst the violence. Well, a foreign minister has criticized the move, saying that shifting the responsibility of protection from the state to the citizens would lead to chaos. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin greeted Finland's president with a handshake and a warning. The warning being, if his Finland join NATO, Russia will respond. 
Finland and Sweden have increased cooperation with the Western Military Alliance since Russia's annexation of Crimea and its backing for separatist rebels in eastern Ukraine. At a press conference, Putin said, What do you think we'll do if Finland joined NATO? We move our forces back 1,500 kilometers out of the way. Would we keep them there? He continued, how they secure and defend the safety of their country is the Finns' choice. And we appreciate, he said, Finland's neutral status. So I'm sure in the back of his mind he's thinking if they do ally with NATO, then they're going to lose that neutral, neutral uh, country there. Well, the Pan-Orthodox Council currently being held on the Greece island of Crete has Ukraine awaiting a decision. The unique gathering of Eastern Orthodox patriarchs started on June 19th after a thousand-year break. Wow, that's a very long time. Later at one of the synods, uh, patriarch came together to discuss uh, what they called important matters. And I believe that was the patriarch of, of Bulgaria there. Uh, the Pan-Orthodox Council, uh, because certain members of the council will not attend the meeting, citing that there were strong critics of prepared documents. The Russian Orthodox Church also held a synod on the matter of attending the Pan-Orthodox Council. One of the members spoke saying, When the Bulgarian Orthodox Church said that it will not come, we decided to hold the meeting to hold the meeting of the Holy Synod. Now, these days, two more churches said they will not come, while another said that it needs to be postponed. With this new situation, we had to convene our own synod to decide if we are going to or not. And that decision came pretty quickly as he continued, we have decided that if these churches don't want to come, then we can't come to the Pan-Orthodox Council too, because such a meeting wouldn't be a Pan-Orthodox Council and consensus would be impossible. The only solution, he said, is to postpone the council. That is what we are going to suggest, he said, to Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew. The Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew I, has managed to organize a council of the 14 Orthodox churches. In January of 2016, all agreed to participate, but last-minute misunderstandings have led to cancellations to attend the meeting. Bulgaria, Georgia, Antioch, and Russia were not able to attend. The 10 remaining patriarchs and archbishops from the 10 remaining churches will be meeting in Crete. Now, the purpose of the meeting is to strengthen unity, resolve misunderstandings, and establish a policy with other Christian churches. Hmm. Uh, the council meeting will run from June 19th through June the 25th. And concerning the matters of the church brought up during the meeting, some suggest not officially finishing until the missing patriarchs accept the agreement. So apparently there are already things that are on the table that are going to be brought up and discussed that the other four of the 14 need to be in agreement with. Interesting that it's been so long, a thousand year break, that they decided, you know, this time period right now to, to get together mm -hmm. and have these, uh, have these talks. Kind of so. makes you wonder what other type of uh, opposing forces might be kind of scratching at their door. Absolutely. Mm. Well, don't forget to contact the House of Yahweh and request your free Prophetic Word magazine and monthly newsletter. To contact them, you can write them at The House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites, www.yahweh.com, www.yisraelhawkins.com, and www.yahwehsbranch.com. You can also visit our website at www.ypnnews.com. For any emails, you can email the House of Yahweh at info at Yahweh.com. And for any calls outside the United States, you can call the number on your screen now. And once again, don't forget to check out the Israel Says program, the best Bible study tool on the market to answer all your scriptural questions with scriptures. Well, up next, it's not a pan-Orthodox council, but the person that is ordained to bring forth the Council of Peace, Israel Hawkins. For all of us here at YPN News, I'm Katan Alexander. And I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. Thank you for watching.